free. I want to tell the world that I'm happy I got Jesus right here in my heart. I'm alive and living. Oh, because I'm forgiven, I got Jesus right here in my heart. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. What a sight just to see all the happy faces praising God in heavenly places. What a thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Plenty of room in the family, room for the young and the old. Plenty of happiness, plenty of love, plenty of room the fall. Plenty of room in the family, room for the young and the old. Plenty of happiness, plenty of love, plenty of room in the fall. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join hands with Jesus as we travel this song. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. For I'm part of the family. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how great. Beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great. Oh, see. 
is our song is sweet Jesus sweet Jesus what a wonder you are and what a wonder he is in our lives let's sing together sweet Jesus sweet Jesus what a wonder you are you are brighter than the morning star you Jesus day after day. I live for Jesus day after day. I live for Jesus. Oh, come what may. The Holy Spirit, I will Just before we do pray, um, we know that we will miss Don here. I think that it would be um, remiss of me not to also mention that Don's presence hasn't only been felt in this church. He has given extensively to the community over the years. Very particularly, he's given in service to charity Drug Arm, which is the um, inheritor of all the Christian temperance movement's heritage. Uh, many long years of service and I know that they are glad for you to be moving close to your family but they also miss you and are very grateful for the contribution you made over many years. Now I'd just like to invite all of you who are able to kneel with me as we seek God in prayer. Let's do that. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence here this morning and we worship you. We worship you as our maker, the creator of all the universe and as he who sustains our life moment by moment. We worship you also, Lord, as the one who has saved us. 
We thank you for the gift of Jesus. Father, pray, help us to be still in your presence here this morning and to know you are God. To know something of what it took for Jesus to come as a man and to bear our sins, to take our place, to die our death and to give us life. And Lord, hope and joy and the certainty of eternal life. We thank you. Father, we pray this morning and ask that your Holy Spirit, according to Jesus' own prophet promise, will be here in the midst of us. Lord, as Pastor Zenny opens your word, we pray that we will hear the voice of your Spirit and heeded, Lord, to hear and to heed and to come. Lord, you know the life of every single person here. There is not a thought in their mind, not an exp emotion experienced, but you do not know it completely because of your love for our sage. And we pray to you this morning as the God who knows, the God who loves, and the God who intervenes on a daily basis in our life, and we pray for that intervention for those who are sick. And there are some, Lord, here, and who are normally here, who are very ill indeed. Draw near to them, Lord. And according to your will, because, Lord, your power is unrestricted, so according to your will, we pray for healing. We pray for peace. We pray for relief from pain. And, Lord, you have a plan for each person. And I pray that your hand will be upon each person to fulfill your will, your grand purpose in each life. And we look for the day when Jesus comes. Father, the world is in turmoil because evil reigns, but its reign is coming to an end. It is already a defeated foe. And Father, as we wait, I pray that each person here will experience the fullness of the recreative power of Jesus the same power as it was at work in his resurrection, to know you, to walk with you. And Father, as the world continues, may your will be done, because we can't wait for him to come. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Good morning and happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Put your hand up if you're happy to be here this morning. Oh, everyone's hands should be up. <laughs> Much better. Now I have a question for you. My question is, put your hand up if you have a piggy bank at home. Does anyone have a piggy bank or a savings account? Yes? I can see. That's good. Now, do any of you want to share <laughs> how much you've saved up so far? I think... Remember? You're not sure? Do you want to have a think about it? $60. $60. Oh, wow. I had a hundred two days ago, but then I spent $2. Oh, a hundred dollars. Okay, how about you? I had $365. Wow, $365. $25. Wow, that's a lot of money. Oh, yeah, Gia? $300.35. Wow, he knows the exact number, 35 cents. 
<laughs> okay. Now, what are you saving up for? Is there something in particular that you want to save up for? Remote control monster trucks. Ooh, a remote control monster truck? My house will car when I grow up. A house and car? Oh, you're already thinking about that. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Sure. Okay, who else wants to share? A remote control helicopter. Oh, these remote controls are very, very popular. Geo? Going overseas. Going overseas, okay. Now, boys and girls, very nice. I can see your gold coin there. We're going to stick these on. You, if you can help Angel here, stick on these things that we like to save up for. Now, these things that we save up for are called earthly treasures we've got hmm so angel sticking one on what does that say angel video games okay we've got another one you've got some helpers there an ipad or oh, we've got toys oh We've got outdoor equipment. Maybe some of you like going outdoors, going surfing and um, playing tennis. I'm going to save up money for a house. A house too. Oh, and lucky last, clothes. Okay. So I want you <laughs> to remember these things. These are called earthly treasures. Can you say earthly treasures? Okay. Now, in the Bible, in Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, okay, where ne neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Now, don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with saving up for these earthly things, okay? However, we need to be very, very careful about the treasures we are building up for, okay? We have to make sure that this doesn't become the most important thing in our lives. We shouldn't have to worry so much about building our treasures here on earth. We should concentrate more on setting our hearts on building up our treasures in heaven. Okay. So, Angel, can you help me out? Can you tell me what are some ways we can build up treasures in heaven? Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's have a look at the other ways we can help to build our treasures in heaven. Okay, so I need some volunteers who would like to help me out. We've got a few examples here on what um, treasures, heavenly treasures are. Gio, off you go. Can you read that for me? Shelter home. Yep. So helping in the shelter homes. What else can we do to build up our heavenly treasures? Oh, Ben. Feed the hungry. Feed the, oh, sorry, Jake. Jake, sorry, Jake. Feed the hungry. Very good. Celine, do you want to read this one? Giving to the poor. Giving to the poor. Do you want to stick that in our heavenly I piggy bank? I We've I got two more. Offering? Offering. Okay. Let's stick that onto our treasures on earth. Now, oh. okay, there's one more. All right, there's one more left. We'll give you a turn. Forgiving others who have hurt you. Okay. Now, 
Angel, would you like to read the last scripture from the Bible? So remember, boys and girls, remember these heavenly things. This is what you want to focus on. Okay, so I'll read it. It says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thieves come near and no moths destroy. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Um, we hope and we pray, boys and girls, that you are faithful each day to building up your treasures in heaven. Thank you for listening, and you can go back to your seats. And for, and for those of you who don't know, the blue bag is for the um, church um, loan repayment offering, and the red bag is for our annual sacrifice offering. I'll invite you all now to uh, bow your heads as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today. Many of us have different difficulties, um, different things that are challenging in their lives today. And Lord, we want to thank you that we have this church as, as a place to, to come with our heavy burdens. But Lord, we, we pray now as, as we have the offering, Lord, that you will bless it and you will give it um, to, the, to where it is needed. Lord, we pray this all in your precious name. Amen.
Let me just remind you that today is a farewell lunch, so don't forget that. Please join us for lunch after the sermon. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we want to look, know the mind of Jesus. And we want to know the mind of and heart of Jesus. And we want to know his will. But most of all, we want the transforming power of Christ in us. So Lord, today as your word is presented, may it be aided by the power of the Holy Spirit as it meets the needs of your people today. And this is what we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is one of the jewels of the gospel. Come to me is Jesus' invitation. But I want you to see, contrary to many who might think differently, that this call is given not to all. And don't think me pre that I'm preaching the heresy because it is not heresy, because Jesus is very specific. Are you there? Just want to see that you are present. This call is not for all, but for a specific group. Call is given to a group, not to all. So what is the group? I want us to look at it very carefully. I want us to, in chapter, chapter 11 of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is addressing two groups of people. There's a group of people who are indifferent. And there is another group of people that he calls at the very end of his talk. And this group is the group that he calls the heavy laden. Let me explain. Jesus gives a damning assessment of a messianic period that is carved, if you will, from the time of John the Baptist all the way to the Messiah, to himself. And now, after he's been ministering for a little while, he is assessing the period of time that has gone by and he's talking to the people as he gives the assessment of this period. It was triggered by John and his disciples who came to Jesus to ask him, are you the one? And as Jesus answers the question, he also gives an assessment of this period of time. First, what Jesus says is that this was the most powerful time, the, most, the, the time when God displayed the greatest power. In fact, Jesus is using the word that he would never use afterwards, that he never used before, and he uses the word, word violence. The power of God has broken through in such a violent, if you will, way, most powerful way. And Jesus is almost paralleling two most powerful events of the past. 
like the event of creation, where God would speak, let there be light, and bang, there was light, power, energy, massive. There's another one in biblical history, which is Exodus, where God's amazing power was a display, and the redemption of a bunch of slaves took place. Through what? The series of of miracles that God did one after the other, altogether ten. Power of God released. And Jesus is here comparing and making this period even greater than these two greatest events of history. And he says, from the time of John until now, the power of God has been unparalleled in what happened in relatively small space of the land of Palestine. Yet, by and large, the most people were indifferent towards the gospel. He's signaling out three towns where the miracles of God happen on a daily basis. Jesus would revisit these towns like no other town they witnessed incredible miracles that Jesus performed in those places. And Jesus has a dumbing assessment. He said they were indifferent to the gospel. So the outcome, Jesus says, there are two outcomes. The first one, no repentance, which tells you that Jesus and his mighty works is always purposeful, which is to target the heart of humans, to change the heart of humans, and turn them towards him. But repentance did not come. Even though mighty works were displayed, Jesus said, because no repentance came, the judgment would come as a future event. And then Jesus basically said this, we, meaning John and himself, played to you, played to you a music, played to you a flute. We performed a drama for you, but you would not dance. We were the greatest performers with the purpose that it would impact you. But it didn't happen. Jesus performed the best ever music piece or drama piece, but no response from the audience came. They were impressed shortly, by and large, but the change did not take place. What a damning assessment. Why not? Why not? Here's the answer. They were dancing to the tune of their own idols. And somehow, the idols specific to each one of them possessed their heart and they were never lured away from it. And they never started to dance to the music of the gospel damning assessment of a group that Jesus calls indifferent. But there's another group. There's another group. They at the end of chapter 11. Who is the group of heavy laden? What does Jesus do for the group of heavy laden? What are the unburdened to do for Jesus? And a warning against putting on a wrong burden. So let's start. Who is the group of heavy laden? This is the group it's maybe you, it's not everyone. This is the group that suffers physically, mentally, spiritually. 
And he says to them, come, come to me. You have come to the end of yourself. You are ready to give up. Now I'm calling you to myself. Come to me, those of you who suffer physically, who suffer mentally, those of you who suffer spiritually, come to me. I will give rest to your soul. I want you to see that when Jesus gives this call, come to me, those who are heavy laden, this text is very much paralleled by another one, which is Jesus' most famous sermon, and that is the Sermon on the Mount, or we know it as Beatitudes. Jesus would talk about the stages of the entry into God's kingdom. The very first stage of the entry into, the God's, into God's kingdom is your brokenness, is your pain, is your suffering, and a recognition that there is nothing you can do about it. That you have come to the end of yourself. Jesus says, you are close. You are there. You're almost there. And he would say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who cry. And here, he, Jesus says, come to me, all who are heavy laden. It's pretty much the same. He's talking about the initial stages of the entry into the kingdom of God. This is the group of people aff afflicted physically, mentally, spiritually, and who fully realize that they cannot help themselves and they need God who will save them. Come to me. Come to me. Those who are heavy laden. So what does he do for this group? What does he do? Look what it says. Come to me all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what does he do? What does Jesus do for you? Not for all. But for you who is heavy laden. And you know that you can't help yourself. Here it is. He says, come, I will unburden you. That's the first thing he will do. Come, I will unburden you. And then, it's really interesting when you look at the text. He says, after I unburden you, I will burden you. That's interesting. Let's look at it. You do know, as Jesus was crisscrossing Palestine, from town to town, from village to village, from place to place, he was doing exactly this. He was unburdening, physically suffering, mentally suffering, spiritually suffering people. As he would come to the place, it was full of pain and suffering as he left the place it was full of joy and rejoicing and gladness and happiness and praising God that's what he did that's why he came to bring gladness to unburden people from their burdens to bring them joy to bring them ultimately salvation come to me Jesus says I will first unburden you. How is it with you today? Still hard, trying hard, but it's not working. Do you sense that you are in this group? Do you sense that you are in this group? I want to remind you, this is not a message for all. Definitely not a message for all. It is for you, heavy laden. 
This is a good place. This is an invitation to you. Heavy burden. Physically. Mentally. Spiritually. Come. I'll unburden you. I'll unburden you. Come. I want you to see the important truths that we uncover here. Because we want to know the mind of Christ. We want to know ourselves, if you will. The first truth is this. When we become burdened, we cannot unburden ourselves. Do you realize that? Jesus is talking about a group of people who have come to realize that they cannot unburden themselves. That they need somebody from the outside to help them. That's why he's called Savior. I can't do it. Now, here's a question. Who unburdens us? Well, look. can be a doctor. Doctors are there to unburden us. And this is true. It's a boyfriend. Could be another one. Could be a friend. Can unburden you. Because you have a need. You have a need. And friends are there for To help you. It can be family. It can be job. You're unemployed. You need to take a responsibility of a family. So you need to work. Because there's too much burden and pressure on the whole family. You need to earn money. So kind of all of these are things or people that can, unbur that can unburden us. Isn't it true? It has to be something or somebody from the outside that can do it. But Jesus is saying this. He's saying, I am ultimately the one who can ultimately unburden you of your burdens. What does that mean? Compare the doctor and Jesus. Doctors can do it. Nurses can do it. But partially, not fully. He says, I'll do it fully. Money can do it and does it partially, but not fully. Boyfriend, can do it, but once again, partially, not fully. He says, I am the ultimate one who does the unburdening. This is another truth that is important as he speaks to you today and he says to you, come to me. If we trust that anything else except for Jesus can ultimately unburden our body, heart, and soul, this very thing that we trust can do it for us will become our greatest burden that in fact will enslave us. If you think it's money and you start to trust it, you will be slave of money. If you think that it's a boyfriend that will do it, that can enslave you. If you think that it's a doctor, again, whatever you trust is your ultimate unburdener, will be your, become your enslaver. Come to me, he says. Come to me. I am the ultimate one. For your body, for your mind, and for your soul. Jesus is calling, calling only those who will fully trust him to be for them, the ultimate one who gives them rest. 
want you to see that the come to me to unburden you is all about Jesus meeting our immediate greatest needs, whatever they are. It's all about meeting my needs. But then, once he has done that, once he has done that, he says, now, I want to burden you. Got a phone call last week from a friend. He's my table tennis coach. And he's been doing so well. He lost 15 kilos, totally fit. Two, three weeks ago, he was to play against the best player in Australia because he himself is number three in Australia. But just prior to the game, he was hit with anxiety. Just came out of blue. Just came out of blue. He said, Bradinha, that's how he calls me, something from brother. Maybe Chilean version of it. Uh, he said, we can't, we can't practice tomorrow. He said, what's happening? He said, look, I don't know what happened. I just can't. I, I have incredible anxiety and, and it just came out of blue and I'm just totally incapacitated. And that's where I am. And just that week, I've been reading the text about Jesus who came to unburden us. And I say to him, Bruno, uh, brace yourself. Are you ready? He said, I am. See, in the past, Bruno and I would pray. And even before, we, you know, sometimes he would play and then we would stop and we would talk. We would talk about Jesus. But it hasn't been happening for a long time. And, uh, and I say, Bruno, God wants to unburden you. And I am certain that he's in the business of doing that for you. And I explain to him what God is and wants to do for people who come to the end of themselves and just seek him with all their heart and soul. And I said to him, we prayed basically, and then I shared with him the second part, but Bruno, I said, this part of unburdening is God's specialty. But what he then wants to do, he wants to burden you. Before I tell you what happened with Bruno, I'm going to talk to you about the second part. Look what Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus wants to burden us? What is the difference about this burden from the burden we just desperately wanted to get rid of? And what does he burden me with? I want you to see that when Jesus compares these two burdens, he calls one what? Heavy. Yeah, heavy. And the other one is? Light. That's a major difference. It's a major difference. One is heavy and one is light. Physical, mental, spiritual struggles that we have, it's heavy. It's just bringing us down and we don't know how to wiggle out of it. He says, I will unburden you. I will unburden you. I will give you freedom. Physical, mental, spiritual. I want you to see uh, also the heaviness and the lightness. Look, the heavy part of a burden is attitude. I can do it on my own. And we struggle. That's the attitude. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And I can do it on my own. 
I don't need anyone. You and I must change that attitude. We can't do it on our own. We need friends. We need Jesus most of all. Jesus is saying, I am yoked with you. And I want to be yoked with you. Is it easier for two or just for one? Very often we burden ourselves for the sake of our own glory. We ha work hard. And the end goal that we want to have is some glory. And the motive that we have, and Jesus gave us a light burden, is for the sake of God's glory and for the, for the needs of other people. So what do the unburdened do for Jesus? So what specifically is this burden? The clue is given in the word yoke. And also what comes in beatitudes after poor in spirit, mourning and meek. You see, the yoke, when I spoke to Bruno about yoke, he, I said to him, Bruno, do you know what yoke is? He said, is that egg? <laughs> no, Bruno, I said, it's not egg. It's a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals and attached to the plow or car that they are to pull. That's a yoke. That's a yoke. So those who have been unburdened by Jesus now put themselves voluntarily under Jesus' yoke. And what is Jesus' yoke? That's a question. What is his yoke? I want you to see what comes in Beatitudes after poor in spirit, those who mourn and those who become meek. Remember, those are the steps of entry into the kingdom. This is what it is. This is the yoke. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's a yoke. And there's another one. Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus is saying, come to me. The yoke is light. I want you to know me. That's a yoke. That's a part of a yoke. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. All I want is to place in your heart hunger and thirst for myself. Jesus... Paul would say it after this, for me to live is Christ. That's a yoke. And then he prayed for people in Ephesus. I want you to have the knowledge of Jesus. That is my greatest prayer for you, most important prayer for you. I want you to know Jesus intimately. Intimately. That is a light yoke. As Jesus unburdens you, he bids you to come to him to know me, to know him. Let me ask you, is that hard? Is that hard? I didn't hear it. It's not hard. Let me ask you, how are you going? How are you going with the yoke of Christ who is calling you to get to know him on a daily basis. Is it possible that you are under such a heavy burden and you are saying, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And you know that it's getting harder and harder. But the desire to call Christ into your life, to be yoked with him and to get to know him is not there. Is that possible? Why? Today, Jesus is calling you to be yoked with him, to get to know him on a more intimate basis. 
You have what it takes. What you have is your burden. What you have is your burden. He says, come to me. Come to me. I will unburden you. But then I will place in your heart a desire to come to know me. The second aspect of that yoke is this. Blessed are the merciful. Be yoked with me in helping the heavy laden. Be yoked with me to help those who are heavy laden. I observe in my life, and I observe in the lives of many people, just watch, listen. You will find two groups of people, and none of those is wrong. One will talk about their problems, about their issues, about their heavy burdens. You, you, you agree with that? About their problems, about their issues, about their heavy burdens. And all of us can find ourselves in that group from time to time and in those stages. And Jesus is calling us, yeah? Come to me. But there's a second group. And the second group is this group who is looking for people who are heavy laden. Do you see that? They have been placed with the yoke of Christ. And they, like Jesus, are looking for those who are burdened. Put, I put my yoke upon you. And I pray that we will be people who will always come to him with our burdens, but that will not only stay in that stage but that we will be people who will be yoked to know Christ more than anyone else, more than anything else, but that we will be people yoked to help people in need. Well, come to me to unburden you is all about my problems, and I am to focus on Jesus. I'm the focus of Jesus' attention Come to me to burden you is all about, G, about getting to know Christ. And it's all about other people and not about you. If you meet the person and it's constantly about that person and about their struggle, they have not learned how to come to Christ to be unburdened. And they never come to the stage of being yoked to him in getting to know his heart and mind and being transformed by him. And never in a stage to be oriented towards others and their needs. Don't be there all the time. Jesus has, has solution for both groups. For both groups. Let me finish with this. Pastor Jared preached last time, but this is a connection to what he preached about last time. Because Jesus sends a warning about putting a wrong burden on yourself. I want you to see this clearly. At that time, starts chapter 12, and there are two events taking place. Both of those are taking place on what day? Sabbath. And Sabbath is a day of? And Jesus previously said in chapter 11 at the end, come to me to have what? Rest for your soul. What is the day today? Sabbath. What is it for? For rest of your body and of your soul, of total salvation in Christ Jesus. Come to me, he says. Come to me. But here's a warning that he sends to all of us. To be not burdened by a wrong burden. The two events, 
Jesus and disciples at grain field and Jesus healing a man with a withered hand. There were two main actors in these two events. Pharisees and Jesus, on the other hand. Pharisees, they would like to put a wrong type of rest and burden on you. And Jesus wants to put the right type of rest and burden on you. They had a clash on that Sabbath day during two events. Clash. Pharisees consider Jesus as the breaker of the law. Why? Why? Tell me why. Because he allows his disciples to pluck grain on Sabbath. Therefore, he's breaking the law. Also, he's breaking the law because he is healing the man with the withered hand on Sabbath. What's wrong with this? I want you to see this. Pharisees rest on Sabbath, don't they? I can't hear you. They rest on Sabbath. And they only, not only rest, but they insist on resting on Sabbath. Yeah? Now, but they rest on Sabbath in order to work out their salvation. Do you get that? They rest, but underneath their rest is hard work. Reminds me of a picture of a goose on a water. Above the water, goose is at peace and at calm, but under the water, it's doing this. That's Pharisees. Working out their salvation by keeping the law. Do you get that? I, I didn't hear anything. Okay. That's what Paul later on is going to talk about. They use God's law as an instrument of work to work out their salvation. Behind Pharisees, rest is hard work. And the outcome is what? It's failure. Who can ever perfectly keep the law of God on their own? None. At the level of motive, at the level of perfection of it. So seemingly, Pharisees are at rest. But deep down, it's the greatest burden that anyone can place on anyone. They're using the law of God as an instrument or work to work out their salvation. They burden themselves and others. And on one occasion, Jesus says, you have put such a great burden on people and you yourself cannot carry it. Jesus, on the other hand, works the deeds of mercy to unburden the heavy laden on Sabbath. What do people on Sabbath need? Tell me. Rest to their souls. He gave rest to heavy laden on Sabbath. Enjoy. Not only that, he absolves heavy laden from earning their salvation. Do you know that Jesus absolves you of any attempt, of any attempt to earn your salvation because he provided it for you? He burdens heavy laden, and don't forget that, in chapter 11, with two things to get to know him. Get to know him. Like no other day, this is the most beautiful day to get to know him. Sabbath is for that. But Sabbath is also to partner him, to get yoked 
in helping those who are burdened physically, mentally, and spiritually. That's also what Sabbath is for. Come to me. Come to me. Those who are burdened and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Why, why don't we? Why don't you? Why don't you? Can I invite, as I look around, I know some people who are struggling, who have been struggling. If you would like to come down, let us just pray for you. Let us pray that God will do his part, that he will unburden you. I don't know what is going on in some of your lives, but I'd like to pray for you. If there are those of you who are really heavy laden and heavy burdened and would like this not to be some kind of intellectual exercise, I'd like you to come. As I spoke that day with Bruno, as you are thinking and as you are coming out, if you would like to come out and we have a prayer for you, just please do so. I will, I will tell you this, the rest of the story, but I'd like you to come and let's have a prayer so that God does his work. As I speak to Bruno that, that, that night, and say, Bruno, but God wants to, um, to burden you as well. God wants you to get to know him. He wants you to get to know him. That is a light burden. It's not how I think he said to me, Pastor, I know. I know that's true. Because in the past, remember that we would pray and that we would talk and I would even read the Bible, but I totally neglected it. And I'm really sorry about that. And I uh, said, Bruno, it's a light burden that God wants to put on you to get to know him. Then I said to him, Bruno, but God also would, wants to put another burden, and that is that you help people who I need. That you help people who I need. It's not about you. It's not only about your problems. Once God unburdens you, he wants you to look at people who have problems and issues. So you turn your attention to them. It's not only about you. It's not only about you. So God wants you to think and help people who I need. And I prayed that night with him. Next day, I gave him a call. I said, Bruno, how are you going? He says, Pastor, much better. I slept last night really well. But he said, you won't believe what happened. I said, what happened? He said, that night, as soon as you finished prayer, I get a text. And my mother-in-law sends me a text. She never did that before. And she wrote to me and she said, Bruno, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. He said, I was kind of freaked out. How could this happen at this kind of a, around the same time? And then she started talking to him and she said, Bruno, I know you haven't been, you haven't been working. And... Uh, and and I, but I have something, if you could help me. She, he said, what? He said, there are some people who desperately need something. And he then freaked out. He remember what I said to him. That the yoke of Christ, that we help other people. He said, everything just fell into place. He just couldn't believe it. That the word of God is not just a, some kind of intellectual, theological exercise. It's real. It's true. So what I was saying to you and what the Bible is saying to you is true. It's true. My burden is light. My burden is light. If there's anybody else who would like to come, please come as we pray. Let's pray for especially those of you who have come. Jesus, you said, not me. Come to me. All of you who are burdened and heavy laden, come and I will unburden you. I will give rest to your soul. Jesus, these people who have come up and those who are seated are asking that of you now. 
You are the master of unburdening. Do it by a miracle of your mighty acts that you have done when you were in Palestine 2,000 years ago. You are the same or similar people with their specific burdens. Lord, please unburden them. As you do so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will place a burden upon us. That we will hunger and thirst after your righteousness. As you have unburdened us of our own. And Lord, that you will give us different eyes, not only to look to ourselves, but now to look to the needs of others. Many others who are burdened and heavy burdened. So Lord, I pray that you will save us from a danger of working out our salvation through our works but to rest in your work of salvation that you provided for us on the cross of Calvary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you are doing now and what you will do tomorrow for us and what we can do with you as we partner you for others. And in your name we pray. Amen. Risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, He's always near. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives. Salvation to
thank you that you came today and gave us the call today. And Lord, continue to walk in our, with us as we are yoked with you. We ask this in your name. Amen.